a wonderful, wonderful passage we have about how God judges sin. But I want to begin by saying many people scoff at God's judgment. Many people scoff at God's judgment, and they say that a loving God cannot send sinners to hell uh, to suffer eternal uh, damnation. They say that is just too cruel to be true, and they say a loving God really uh, uh, cannot condemn people to burn in hell forever. I'll give you my personal story, and I've given it before. Uh, when I received Jesus Christ on November 9, 1999, a, co a very close colleague of mine mockingly told me that God cannot be so narrow-minded only to save a few born-again believers. Of course, my friend was very unhappy because I'd received Christ. We used to carouse with him, and now here I am telling him I'm born again, and he was like, what? What do you mean? So only you and a few people will go to heaven, and he was like, no. And he told me, no, God cannot be so narrow-minded to save only a few born-again uh, born believers while condemning the majority of unbelievers. Amazing. And there I am telling him I'm born again, and he's like, ah, forget it. There's nowhere. You're not. And actually, he went further to tell me, to ask me, uh, whether God is going to send everybody in India, he mentioned India, not me, and China to hell because, uh, you know, those are the most populous nations on earth and majority of people are not Christians, they're not believers. So his question to me was, are you saying everybody in China and in India will go to hell because they are not believers like you? In other words, this thing you're telling me about salvation, just forget it. There's nothing like that. All of us are going to go to heaven. Unfortunately, as a young Christian, I couldn't answer those questions. Indeed, I was very confused, and I almost thought I'd made the wrong decision. I mean, there you are, your colleagues, people you've always hung around with, and now they are challenging, challenging you. And I was like, have I done the right thing? Of course, I had not studied the Bible, so I could not respond. But now I have read the Bible. Uh, for the last 20 years, I've been studying the Bible, and now I can tell you that God is holy and perfect, and his wrath burns against the sin of man. God is holy, God is righteous, and his wrath burns against the sin of man. All of us are sinful. Uh, we sinned uh, from first father Adam. We sinned, we've sinned. We have the DNA of sin in us, and that the wrath of God is burning against us. And, and although God is merciful and is gracious and is patient with sinners, if we don't repent, uh, when the appointed time comes, God will judge, and his judgment is swift and dreadful, as we are going to see in the passage tonight. When the time of judgment comes, the judgment will come, it will be swift, it will be dreadful. In Genesis 18, 19, we see God raining sulfur, burning sulfur on Sodom. Now, sulfur, is, if it's thrown on you, is bad enough. But God was throwing burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah, for their grievous harm uh, seen against him. In the end, everyone in Sodom and Gomorrah was killed. This was like nuclear bomb. Everybody was killed except one small family of Lot and his four uh, people there. Only one family was saved, a righteous family of Lot. Now, this judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah is a prelude to the final judgment that is coming at the end of the age. There is another judgment that is coming when all people, great and small, will be judged for their sin. So indeed, as we go through this lesson tonight, we need to know what we are studying here is actually an indicator of what is going to happen at the end of the age. All will be judged, and if all of us are found not to be righteous, uh, we will be destroyed. It will be annihilation like we see in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And our key lesson tonight is God's perfect judgment of sin is sure and can be trusted. God's perfect judgment of sin is sure and can be trusted. I have two divisions. The first division is God's perfect justice, Genesis 18, 16 to 33, God's perfect justice. And the second division is God's perfect salvation, uh, Genesis 19, the whole of Genesis 19. So God's perfect justice and God's perfect salvation, the two divisions. Let's go to the first division and then look at God's perfect justice. Let's see how it looks like. Now, last week, we left, over where, we left off where Abraham and Sarah had a visit from the Lord and two angels. I know you remember that very well. I remember they came visiting uh, 
Abraham invited them in, and of course, uh, the visitors promised Abraham that Sarah would have a, cha a son uh, by uh, that time the following year. So after eating, after having the meal, they said Sarah would have a, a child. And if you remember, Sarah laughed in utter disbelief, and God asked, is anything too hard for the Lord? And remember, at the beginning of chapter 18, we were told he is God Almighty. So uh, God is asking, is anything too difficult, too hard for the Lord Almighty? And God confirmed, I'll return uh, to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. That's where we left off last week. And now in verse 16, we see uh, now uh, the men got up to leave. They've finished. They've given their uh, message of the visit. And they are leaving. Uh, they look down towards Sodom, and Abraham escorted them out of his homestead. So Ad uh, Abraham, being a very good host, he is escorting his guests uh, out of his homestead. I'm sure he was rejoicing because he has been told now he's going to have this son of the promise. And as they departed, uh, God decided to reveal his plan to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah to Abraham. In verses 17 to 19, God asks, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? So God is always confiding with his friend. If you're a friend of God, <clears throat> God will not do anything until he tells you. And you and I know people, even when they are sick and unwell, if something is happening to them, God does reveal to them. And we know people have called their families together to tell them they think time is up and now they want to uh, just bid farewell to their people. So here God is saying, I'm, I'm going to tell Abraham my secrets. And we also know from scriptures, Amos 3, 7, God does nothing without revealing his secrets to his servants, the prophet. Abraham is a, prophet, is a servant of God, is a prophet of God, and God is going to reveal his secrets to yeah, to him. You and I need to be friends of God. So then God can reveal his secrets to us. We need to be faithful men. We need to be in love with God. We need to love God through Christ. But also we know God had already promised Abraham would become great and a powerful nation and all nations of the earth would be blessed through him. So another reason why God needed to confine with Abraham because he was going to be a great and powerful nation so uh, he needed to know what is going on. Thirdly, God had chosen Abraham and his descendants to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord would fulfill his promises uh, to Abraham. In other words, Abraham and God, they had a, this wonderful, wonderful relationship. So really God uh, just needed to confine with this man who is going to be uh, a blessing to everybody. And so in verses 20 to 21, we see the Lord saying, the outcry, telling Abraham, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great. And they are seen so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. So God tells then Abraham, I'm going to go down there, Sodom and Gomorrah. Jerusalem, of course, is up in, on a hill or in the highland up where, where Abraham was. And of course, uh, we know that... Uh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah were in the valley, Jordan Valley, and of course they are looking down, and of course God says I'm going down there. Now we need to say that God is omniscient. He knows the impact of the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, and actually he didn't need to go there. So this is a manner of speaking. Uh, he wants to explain himself in understandable language to Abraham. So he says I'll go and see, and if the sin is as bad as it is, then I'll do something about it. This is not the first time God has come down. Remember the burning bush when God met Moses, he also came down and he told uh, Moses, I've heard the cries of the, my children of Israel in Egypt, I've come down and I want to send you to go and liberate them. And of course in this study we've seen also God coming down at the Tower of Babel and he, is, he was personally involved in bringing judgment on what was going on there. You and I also need to know that God is in our lives. God is not distant. Whatever is going on in our lives, God is very present. And for us now, uh, after the Pentecost, God is present in us in the power of the Holy Spirit. So God doesn't need to come down to know what is happening in your life, in my life. Uh, God is always present with us, and we can engage with him. And he's omniscient, he knows everything. And even when we go to God, we don't need to tell him uh, a lot of stories, what is going on. God already knows 
We just need to tell God what we need him to do for us. And, as, and although God's mercy and patience are great, uh, God, we know he doesn't tolerate sin. And when sin reaches a certain kind of a threshold, God will come down and get personally involved in bringing out judgment. In verses 22 and 23, we see then the men turned away. Those are the two angels. They went towards Sodom. So those actually were the ones that were going to uh, be execute the judgment. And we see here God remaining behind and Abraham remained standing before the Lord. So uh, the men have already gone. God has already decided they know what to do. Uh, but uh, God is left here standing with Abraham. Then Abraham said to God, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? You see, when you're a friend of God and God tells you something, uh, you know how to respond. Of course, uh, Abraham, because he understood the heart of God, he knew God wanted him to intercede. Uh, he knew God needed, wanted him to pray. And here, he starts actually to intercede, to pray, and actually to engage God's heart. What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep away and not spare? That word spare there is forgive. Will you not forgive them? Yeah, for the sake of the uh, 50 righteous people, okay, in the city. Will not the judge of the universe do right? You see, Abraham knows God, and he knows God doesn't delight in punishing people. He knows God does not delight in, in punishing people, and he knows God does not delight in sin. And Abraham here says, how about if there are 50 righteous people? I, I love Abraham because he did not even start with his brother, uh, nephew Lot, or the family. Abraham goes for 50 people, a big number. So it tells you, Abraham really, the heart was for the people. And he figured maybe in his heart, well, we can't lack 50 righteous people down there, God. So if they are there, really, will you destroy this city. The other thing, of course, uh, Abraham knows God is going to destroy this city. He knows God very well enough to know that. If the time has come, God will do it. So he tells me, God, uh, you can't do it if they are righteous people. You and I, when God confines in us, we need to intercede. We need to pray. Uh, don't say this man or this woman or this child is uh, beyond redemption. We need to pray for people. And we, don't, we can't say this one is above or beyond redemption. In verse 26, we see the Lord said, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare. Remember that word spare is forgive. I will spare, I will forgive the holy place, the whole place for their sake. And this should actually make you rejoice. Because if God finds righteous people in a home, in a community, in a city, in a school, in a university, anywhere in a hospital, I can tell you, God will stay his judgment. So God is always looking in any one situation, whether there are people who believe in him. And I can tell you, we need to have righteous people all around us. And Abraham continues with that talk, intercession. Of course, he moves from 50, 45, goes to 30, goes to 20, goes to 10, and he stops at 10. And in every one situation, God says, I'm not going to destroy. If I find 10 righteous people in this city, I'm not going to destroy it. Now, interesting, we don't know why Abraham stopped at 10. Why he didn't go to one or even two or even four. And he didn't. He stopped at ten. And uh, uh, we don't know why. But also because I think at this point, maybe Abraham understood the heart of God. Maybe his faith went up and knew, really, God is going to do the right thing. We can go through these numbers, eight, seven, six, five, four. But I think they, God has made the point. If I find righteous people there, I'm not going to destroy the city. So Abraham felt uh, satisfied. God knows what he's doing. God's judgment are righteous, and God himself can be satisfied. He knew God was merciful, and whatever God was going to do, uh, he is going to be uh, trustworthy. So Abraham stopped there. Today we too can be sure about uh, God's perfect mercy and God's grace towards us. We can be sure that God is trustworthy. God will not punish the righteous with the wicked, and God knows what is going on in the hearts of men. And so we don't need to despair. Even when things are so bleak, we need to know that God is perfect and that God knows what he's doing and God knows how to separate the wicked and the righteous. And this brings us to our first principle. God's perfect nature guarantees his perfect justice. God's perfect nature guarantees his perfect justice. God is perfect. God is omniscient. In God there is no sin. God knows everything. And because God is omniscient, he only can guarantee perfect justice 
in heaven, in heaven and on earth. Human beings, organization, courts of law, world governments, societies, uh, corporate bodies, they can't give justice. And many a time you and I, we run to this organization, we cannot get justice there. Perfect justice only comes from a perfect God. Only God can guarantee this perfect justice. I'll tell you a story of me again here. There's a time I was hit by a city hopper bus, and it hit me so badly, it kind of cleared the, the, back, the, the back of my car. But what was funny is that this bus did not have insurance. And so even though we went to police station, we wrote statement, they said they would pay. When I started to follow up, uh, they had no insurance. And now they started taking me around in circles. I appealed to the police. The police said, you follow up with them. Engage the lawyer. The lawyer was getting nowhere. And of course, uh, we didn't even head to, head to court because I was advised by people who were in the know is that this is a lost case. I was never going to get justice. And I can tell you finally what happened. I had to repair my own car with my own now insurance. That is not justice. If somebody hits you, is driving a car, is on the road, he has no insurance, he should have been stopped. I mean, uh, the court should have ruled otherwise. They should have been made to pay. But because in this world you don't get perfect justice, it didn't happen. The corruption in the world does not allow it to have perfect justice. So, what injustices are you facing and where are you looking for perfect justice? All of us have, are facing different type of injustices. Where are you looking for justice? If you are not looking for perfect justice from God, you will not get it. You will run around and I can tell you it's difficult. I'm not, I'm not saying you don't pursue justice, but pursue it knowing you are not going to get perfect uh, justice in this world. Now, like Abraham, how many people are you interceding for to receive God's mercy? We see here Abraham interceding for uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, and actually he makes a very long case from 50 to 45 to 10. To, uh, and he says, God, if you find righteous people, will you destroy it? And God says, no. You and I need to be doing the same. This is a picture of how we need to intercede for people who need God's mercy, people who need God's grace. Make a list of all family members, friends and colleagues who you should be interceding for and start interceding for them. Ask God uh, to be merciful. Ask God to be gracious. Re uh, remind God he can't destroy the wicked and the righteous together. Uh, remind God all these things according to his word and I can tell you God will spare them. Quickly, let's go to a second division and look at how God offers his perfect salvation to the righteous. Now, in Genesis 18.33, we are told, when the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left and Abraham returned home. This is after the intercession. So God has left. He has confided with his friend uh, uh, Abraham. And now uh, Abraham has uh, interceded and God has gone home, uh, got back, uh, back to heaven. Abraham goes back home. So the picture now shifts to Sodom. And we see in verse 19, uh, 1 to 3, we see the two angels, they arrived in Sodom in the evening. Remember, they, had, they left Abraham's uh, place after lunch. Uh, must have been mid-afternoon. And now they have arrived in the evening, uh, just before sundown. And they found Lot sitting at the city gate, city gate which means that uh, Lot was a prominent leader in Sodom. It's amazing because this was a wicked city and a lot is one of the key leaders there. Now you and I need to be very careful when you're the leader of a wicked uh, place, a leader of a wicked city. That is where a lot maybe was very secure, thinking all is well. But here we see being a leader of a wicked city, a wicked corporation, a wicked family, that's not good enough. You need to bring people to God. So, But anyway, here he is. Remember when we left him, when he left uh, Abraham and they divided he went and settled outside Sodom which means now with time he came in to Sodom and actually he was uh, made a leader there uh, very prominent there sitting at the uh, city gate he must have been a judge uh, that is where the prominent people are sitting at the city gate that's where the government of the city was sitting so he's an influential man and you can note here that Lord although he was influential as a political figure he was not influential in matters of God. You can be an influential person in your society, in politics, in government, in science, in history, in whatever. 
If we are not influential in matters of God, there's a problem. And here we see Lot had gone in this city and he didn't share the gospel. And indeed, we see he kind of uh, was the one who was naturalized by this city. So when Lot saw the visitors, uh, he invited them uh, to his house uh, for the night. And uh, after slight hesitation, they obliged. And here we know that Lot could have, because when he asked them where they were going to sleep, they said the city square. I think Lot knew the wickedness of the city. So he knew this man would be mincemeat. So he told them, no, 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 you can't stay at the city square. Better come to my house. So Lot here, very good intention. Come to, your, come to my place. I'll give you food. Uh, you uh, get something to drink, you get water to wash, and then tomorrow morning you can go your own way. So Lot here seeking to protect them. He was still, the heart of God was still with them. Remember, he's already credited with righteousness. It's only that he's living in a lost place. After supper and before they went to bed, all the men of Sodom, can you imagine? All the men of Sodom, we are told, both young and old. Of course, all means the majority of them, uh, virtually all, uh, uh, practically all of them, young and old. So nobody was left behind, surrounded the house. Can you imagine? This is a mob now. They are sur surrounding the house of Lot, and they shouted, where are the men who came to, to you tonight? Bring them out so that we may have sex with them. Really? You see, sin, they don't hide. It's not one person. It's not even two people. It's not even a gang of five. Now, the whole city, everyone, young, old, all men came. And all of them are asking for this. Uh, two men who've come in and they want to have sex with them and they are not even beating around the bush. Really a wicked city. They, there was no pretense at all and there was no hiding and we don't even know whether they knew this were angels or not. Of course, they, all they wanted was to have sex with these men. Now, you and I know that Sodom in the Bible, homosexuality is forbidden. And of course, uh, so what they are doing here really is actually putting their finger in God's eye. But we see here a lot uh, protesting. He said, no, my friends, <clears throat> don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do whatever you like with them. But don't do anything to these men for they have come under my protection of my roof. Amazing man, Lot. Man who is right with God, and here he's doing what? He is proposing, <laughs> he's preventing one sin by proposing another, and even the one he's proposing is even worse, because now he's, he's giving out his family members. You and I need to learn. We can't do that. That was not a choice. You cannot propose to prevent one sin by proposing another sin you only make the matter worse. And you see, the problem of living in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a compromised environment is that now Lot doesn't know what to do. He's in a catch-22 position. He's a righteous man. He's putting these men under his own protection. But now he doesn't know how to tell these uh, mob, no, leave these men alone. They are under my protection. Now he's offering his two daughters. These two daughters were already uh, betrothed uh, to be married so how do you give them out and tell this uh, mob to do whatever they wanted? Compromise. You and I need to come to a point whereby we know we need not to compromise. Even when the situation is hard, even when we are between a rock and a hard place, we need to ask God for help. That's what the Lord should have done, but he didn't. So he proposes something terrible. Uh, but the men, of course, wouldn't, uh, didn't want the girls. Uh, they wanted to sleep with men. So they kept on putting pressure on Lot. Uh, they moved forward to break the door, and uh, we see now they were actually going to use force, but uh, luckily we see the angels, they pulled Lot back, they shut the door, and they struck the mob with blindness. You see, Lot should actually have prayed, God, do something, protect my family, protect these people, protect the angels, or protect these two visitors, these men. But of course he didn't, but of course the angels were not limited. Next time you and I, we are in a difficult place, remember God. God is able to deliver us from any temptation. In fact, the Bible says there's no temptation that is uh, greater than God. In verses 12 to 14, we see the angels warned Lot uh, to get his family out because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah had, was so great and they were going to destroy the city. So at this point, uh, Lot even learns that these were angels, I guess. 
and they were going to destroy the city. And now Lot is told, get your family out. The first thing tomorrow morning, uh, if you have your relatives here, get them out. Uh, we are going to destroy the city. Again, remember, God does nothing until he confines his secrets to his uh, servants and his prophets. Here, Lot is told what God is going to do. You and I need to know if God wants to do something major in our lives or even in our community, God will speak to us. He doesn't change. The same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And you would imagine then Lot should have spent the whole night packing and moving out. He didn't. Why? Because he had invested too much time, uh, too much energy, too much resources in the city. That's why when you greeted your man or whoever you're next to, I asked you to ask them where they live and how much they're investing in the city. If you invest in Sodom, it will be very, very difficult to get out because of your investment, the time, the emotional attachment. Lot here is again in another problem. How does he get out? How does he leave all the houses, all the cars, all the, uh, the, the banks and all this, all the nice places, the restaurants, all the saunas and steams? Well, how does he leave them? And we know he doesn't want to leave. So at night, we see Lot trying to warn his two uh, sons-in-law who are betrothed to his daughters, but they laughed at him. They thought he was joking because he has never shared with them seriously. If you and I are not engaged with our colleagues, with our in-laws, if we don't tell them about Jesus when there's no trouble, when we need them to warn them about something that is happening, they won't listen to us. So we know Lot had not shared with their sons-in-law his faith. We know Lot had not told them about God. We know these people didn't know Lot as a believer. And so when the time came uh, for him to warn them, ah, they thought, father-in-law, is, father is just joking. He's not serious. You know this guy is not serious. So they didn't take him seriously. They thought he was a joker. You and I cannot be a joker. You cannot be a joker in the office. You can't be a joker at home. You can't be a joker in your extended family. No. People need to know you as a man of God. You need to share the word of God. And you need to tell people that there's judgment that is coming. Before even trouble comes. So then when trouble comes, they can say so and so has been warning us. The sons-in-law thought he was joking. He was a joker. That's very sad because your son-in-laws should be able to treat you with a lot of respect and when you want them, they should be able to listen. Here we see again Lot had lost even spiritual influence on his own family. He didn't have. He didn't have. We know even his wife, uh, didn't, he didn't have control and we later on we'll see she's going to look back. At dawn the now the following day, of course that was during the night was when he was warning his two sons-in-law, now at dawn, a uh, lot uh, family is hesitating to leave. Lot himself is hesitating to leave. Uh, the wife and I guess the girls are uh, refusing to leave. And we see a situation where the angels have to grab them by their hands and force them to leave. And actually they told them, you better go. Please leave you too, you four people. Because unless you leave, uh, we'll, we will not be able to destroy this city. And there's a nugget inside there. That when a righteous person is in an environment... God will not touch it. God will not destroy it. We become like the assault, uh, the sword that is preservative. We preserve uh, people even in a wicked city, a wicked home, a wicked environment. The righteous are the preservative. Here we see the angels telling Lord, ah, please get out. Get out with your family because unless you leave, we are not going to be able to destroy this city. So you and I need to celebrate that in families where you come from, in homes where you are, in communities where you live, you are a preservative because uh, God is looking and he knows because he's saying because you're there, I'm there. He will not destroy it until uh, they get you out. In verses 18 to 22, uh, Lord pleaded. Now he's agreed to move, but still he pleaded not to go to the hills. He pleaded to go and settle in a small town uh, called Zoa, which means small. Uh, he didn't want to go to the mountains. You see, too much attached to the glitz of the city. He didn't want to go very far. He wanted to stay nearby. He didn't want the idea of going to the hill. Again, the attachment, emotional attachment to a sinful environment. But we see here also a very interesting picture. When Lot and his family had reached Zohar, Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah by raining burning sulfur from heaven. So God waited. He, the judgment was stayed until um, Lot and his wife and the children reached this city. And that is when uh, God, that's when judgment started. This is the way God operates. That God will give you time for the righteous, gives them time to escape, 
until then God can take a, a judgment. But you see sadly that Lot's wife looks back again. Remember we talked Lot didn't have control over his family, not even his wife. They were told not to look back. But again, the emotional attachment. Why you've been investing your time, your resources, your energy, that is where your heart is. Lot's wife and Lot's, uh, Lot's wife heart and Lot's heart were in Sodom even though they were living. She looked back and she became a pillar of salt. That was her judgment. And now we are told that when Abraham looked down the following morning, he could see, all he could see was dense smoke rising, arising from the land, like smoke from a fiery furnace. And Abraham must have known that for sure his nephew, Lot, must have been saved because he knew the heart of God. That's the beauty of prayer. Because he had prayed, he knew whatever has happened in that place, God will not punish the righteous with the wicked. Now let's talk about the wrath of God because we see God was angry with Sodom because of sin. What is the wrath of God? Now the wrath of God is an expression of his fierce anger towards sin. God is angry with sin and all of us are sinners. From Adam up to where we are, we are all sinners. We have the DNA of sin. Indeed the Bible says there is no one righteous, not even one. God's wrath is not erratic, it's not impulsive. God exercises wrath with perfect justice and absolute knowledge. Remember, God is omniscient. He knows everything. So you and I don't need to worry. What Does God know the entire truth? He does know the entire truth. God is just. God is just. Therefore, he must exercise justice and judge sin. Otherwise, he would not be acting in consistent, consistency with his perfect character. So God must judge sin. Otherwise, if he doesn't judge it, then he's not holy. He can't brook sin. He cannot <coughs> entertain sin. And now people have seen nature and deserve God's eternal wrath uh, because that's what God says. Oh, we are sinners <coughs> and all of us deserve God's wrath. And God's wrath works in harmony with his uh, overall character. So God is not only love. You know, there are people who believe that God is loving, God is compassionate, God is gracious. Now you better wake up. God is also angry with sin. And there's the wrath of God. Uh, that's why some people say God is so loving, can't do this. You better tell them there's an attribute of God called the wrath of God, the anger of God. God does get angry and God does not tolerate sin. Okay? Now, when we don't believe in God's wrath, we question God's justice. And many people do that. They question God's justice. I've, I've been in a situation where you, people, you hear somebody saying, I'm so angry with God because he has done A, B, C, D. No, that is foolishness because you need to understand God is omniscient. God is perfect. God is wise. He knows what he's doing. We only know in part. So next time something happens that you don't understand, uh, ask God why don't quarrel with God. So if we don't believe in God's wrath, we question God's justice, and we struggle to understand the goodness of God because we don't understand what God is doing. When we believe in God's wrath, we understand his anger and we are blessed because he is perfect in all he does. Now we move quickly to the daughters of Lot. Now they've escaped. They've gone to Zohar. Later on they moved on to the mountains. They are living in a cave and now we have a funny story, strange story here. These girls uh, wanted to have children and we are told there were no men so they come up with this small scheme where they are going to get their father drunk and uh, they are going to sleep with him and they are going to have children. Now, that is uh, thinking of Sodom. These guys are from Sodom. They are thinking about men, which is okay. But then, it's not correct that there were no men around. Remember, Abraham could see Sodom from up the hill. It means up the hill where we know Abraham had 32 men who had gone to fight. We know they were up there. So there were men all around. <laughs> <laughs> there were men all around. So these girls, these girls were just misbehaving. Uh, there were men all around. In fact, there were many other communities. But these guys were close, uh, they were close-minded because of this, uh, where they came from. They came from Sodom and their hearts were not right. So they got their father drunk and they slept with him, starting with the eldest. It's, it's, it's really a wicked scheme. And uh, of course, and she got pregnant and the other one also the following day. And we are told the father never got to know what, we, what he was doing. We don't know what they gave him. We don't know. We don't know what they're giving. 
You and I need to be careful you're not given some of those things by people who want to misuse you because that is not correct. And we are told Lot here, he didn't know what he was doing, protected here again by the word of God. And here we know the girls are the ones who had a problem. But he sees us a lot the way he brought up his children. The way we bring up our children, where we bring up our children, there will be consequences. If we bring up our children in Sodom, if we don't train them in the way of the Lord, of course they will pick the way of Sodom, and of course they will come up with all these schemes. And of course, the first one named her son, she gave birth, Moab, which means from father. Can you imagine? She even named this child is from the, from the father, you know? <laughs> and he said, of course, that Moab is the father of all the Moabites. This became very bitter enemies of Israel. The other one called the son Amon, son of my people, of course, because she's coming also from the, 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 the father, and of course, he's the father of the Ammonites. And the point for you and I is that we need to be careful where we live. We need to be careful where we invest. We need to be careful where we are bringing up our families. And we need to be careful of the culture we live in. If we are not sharing the word of God, that culture is going to uh, get into our skin. So this brings us to our second principle. God's perfect nature guarantees his perfect mercy and salvation. God's perfect nature. God's perfect nature guarantees his perfect mercy and salvation. So God, again, is, his nature is perfect. And because, again, because he's a perfect God, he's omniscient, he knows everything, he's just, he's merciful, he's gracious, uh, he will uh, guarantee perfect mercy and perfect salvation. And there's nobody who gives us a better picture for that than the family of Lot. Family of Lot. Not a perfect family, but remember, Lot was already justified. It was credited righteousness to him like Abraham. Although he was living in this uh, wicked place, uh, he, his heart was for God. But you can see the consequences of living in a culture that is compromised, a sinful, wicked culture. So Lord will escape. I, I'm sure his wife will also escape. The daughters, I'm sure they will escape because they were justified. But the consequences of their sin is just too much uh, for them. So we are all sinners who deserve God's wrath and judgment. But God's perfect nature guarantees his perfect mercy and salvation by grace through faith in Christ. For us, it's Christ. If you're in Christ, you've received Christ as Lord and Savior. Whatever happens to you, your salvation is guaranteed because salvation is by grace through faith. But still, don't live in Sodom. Don't compromise. Don't live in a culture that is not glorifying God. Myself, I received this mercy of salvation by grace through faith in November 9, 1999. And from that time, through ups and downs on life, I've seen the goodness of God. And I still accept, 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 um, expect the goodness of God to continue uh, up to the day when he calls me home. So how does the reality of God's wrath motivate you to pray for unbelievers and to share the gospel? Since we know that judgment is Im imminent, and we know at the end of the age that judgment is coming, uh, we need to be motivated to pray for unbelievers. If you know people who don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, pray for them. Share the gospel. Tell them it's urgent because we don't know when uh, judgment is coming, but for sure is imminent now than even uh, than the time of Lord. We also need to share the gospel of Jesus because salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ. Where when and how did you receive God's mercy and salvation through, by grace through faith in Christ? You need to receive Christ yourself. If you are listening to this message, you should be number one who should receive Jesus Christ uh, as Lord and Savior. If you've not received a Christ as your Lord and Savior, uh, you need to ask your leader for a small booklet called Am I Sure? And it will take you through steps of receiving Jesus Christ. So then God's wrath is not against you. As for that small booklet, uh, if you read it, it will take you through the steps of receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can also use that booklet to lead somebody to Christ. But remember, the wrath of God abounds for those who are not in Christ, and that's why we need to come to Christ. Otherwise, the judgment of Lord, the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah is just a prelude of the big judgment that is coming at the end of the age. In conclusion, Please remember that God's perfect judgment of sin is sure and can be trusted. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this warning you've given us uh, through this judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Indeed, your wrath is great against sin. But for those who are justified, those who are born again, those who have received Christ as Lord and Savior, there is no condemnation. They are taken out before the judgment comes to the wicked. Help us to receive this message. Help us to warn others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.